Hi, this is Trey Pass. I'm going to do a reaction to another Mr. Nightmare reaction. This one is called Three Two Scary Horror Stories. Okay, I think told and narrated in the first person. Okay, so again, I love Mr. Nightmare and it's been a while since I've done one. So I'm looking forward to this. Okay, three stories. So let's get right to it. Okay, and please hit the like and subscribe button and, I, and I'll be right back with my reaction. Okay, let me put my headphones on. Okay, there we go. Okay, here we go, right? Now, go. Two scary stories narrated in first person. Story one, anonymous. When my dad was around 50, he got an African gray. He always loved parrots his whole life, so I was happy for him to get one after his retirement. He named the okay. bird Kevin. My dad taught Kevin a whole vocabulary of words, and he actually trained him to understand the meaning behind certain words, like hello, what's up, food, thank you, good, and a few others. My dad passed away at 70, and with that came the time to figure out amongst my siblings and I what would happen to Kevin. My brother and sister didn't want the responsibility of taking Kevin into their homes, plus their spouses were against it too, but I couldn't bear the idea of giving him away to a new home. Kevin was and is one of my last connections to my dad. In a sense, that was his best friend. So I decided I would take him into my home. I put his cage in the den of my house. My house doesn't have a basement, so the den is considered the lowest level of the house. Kevin okay. is a moderately noisy bird. He could be a chatterbox some hours of the day, usually earlier on. But later in the day and at night, he quiets down. When he's okay. too noisy, I'll throw a blanket over his cage and that normally quiets him down. I watch okay. TV in the den at night to keep him company. Then around 10, I'll migrate to my room to let him go to sleep. That's pretty much the backstory behind Kevin. I've been taking care of him for two years now, so I know exactly how he behaves and when he's acting out of the ordinary. Speaking okay. of out of the ordinary, there was one night in December around 11 p.m. that Kevin started making sounds while I was trying to sleep. I sleep with the door open since I live alone and need to be able to hear anything if something's going on in the house. Hearing him making his squawking noises past dark, especially this late at night, is unusual beyond doubt and something was irritating him. I went down to the den to see what was bothering him. He was wide awake on the lower perch of the two in the cage. He looked at me and was saying things like hello and what's up and his name. All the while he was nodding his head up and down moving his whole body in the process as if he were dancing. I tried to feed him but he didn't eat, so I covered him with the blanket hoping he would stop. I was in the kitchen when I stopped inside, because he was still making the noises, and I had a feeling he wasn't going to stop. Having work the next day, I couldn't afford to lose sleep because of him. I really didn't know what to do. I'm still to this day not exactly a bird expert. I went back downstairs and uncovered him. He was still doing his little dance, bobbing his head and body and making his distressed sounds. It didn't click with me, until thinking I heard something in the pantry closet a few feet away from his cage. Uh -oh. I walked over to it and hovered my hand over the light switch to the pantry, which was outside of the door. The door has one of those big glass panels that many pantry doors have, so when I flicked the light switch, I saw the outline of a body on the inside. Whoa. My flight or flight response kicked in, and I chose fight. I opened the door screaming, trying to get my adrenaline rushing, and I grabbed yeah. the man in the pantry closet out and threw him to the floor. He tried to fight back, but I easily overpowered him and had him in what I could best describe as a chokehold. He was a 50-something-year-old homeless-looking man with the smell to match it. I yelled at him, who are you? Why are you in my house? He tried grabbing my face to possibly gouge my eyes or something, but I continued to wring his neck and punch him. During all of this, Kevin was going berserk in his cage. When the man on the floor seemed weak enough, literally sprinted for the nearest phone and came right back and kept him on the ground while I called 911. The man was taken to jail, but he had no ID on him, nothing. He was homeless and had nothing to his name, and as such he was considered what some people call judgment proof, meaning even if I tried to sue him, I wouldn't get anything from him. He had raided my pantry closet that night and had opened jars of peanut butter, boxes of cookies and crackers, and all sorts of other boxed and canned foods. If it weren't for my dad's parrot, I don't know what else that man would have taken or done in my house. I'm grateful for Kevin, and I like to think part of my dad is watching over me and that bird. That's true. 
Story 2 by Quinn Parley. This story takes place when I was a junior in high school. For context, here's a little background information. Back in the day, I was a pretty involved student, took all the hard classes, and was in a few varsity sports. In one of these ways, I was always busy and didn't have much time for myself, and part of me was thankful for that. It provided me an escape from a world where my parents had recently parted ways and my older brother had just gone to college. It was just me and my little brother then. He also was a swimmer and a smart kid in his own right. We were really similar, even to this day. But probably because of the stresses our family situation put on us at the time, we didn't get along, near at all. One of those wet winter days in the Midwest. I'd put in my time at school and swim, and I still had to sit down for several hours of homework. This time I had to write an essay for some advanced class that I wasn't really interested in. I dropped my swim bag at the door when I got home, and looked around my house to see if anyone was home. Empty. Dad must be out with Reese at swim practice. His club team had the slot at the pool after the high school team was done. I popped okay. in a mouthful of Cheez-Its and headed down to the basement to my office to get some school work done. The house was a middle class two story with an unfinished basement with the exception of what I referred to as my office. Mm -hmm. From a career past, my dad used to work from home but no longer did. I was the only one who used this place, so my family or what was left of it just called it Quinn's office. So I made my way across the concrete floors and unattached carpet samples down there to the one finished out room in the basement. I flicked on the CFL light. It was like any other night after practice. I still had hours of homework to do. So I turned on the computer and started typing away. I was typing, typing for what seemed like an hour, trying to bring to words to what the concept of hedonism and the picture of Dorian Gray meant to me as best I could, or as convincingly as I could. Out of the dark, I heard my little brother call out to me, Quinny, Quinny, come up. Almost reflexively, I called back to him, Reese, I'm working, what do you need? We would yell through the house like brothers do, but it took me a minute to realize I didn't hear him come home. I got no response, only for a couple minutes though. Again, I heard my little brother's voice sing out, Quinny, Quinny, come up. It felt strange hearing those words carry across the dark, concrete floor. He's supposed to be at swim practice. I called back out to him, asking if he needed anything, but again, I received no answer. I thought about just starting my essay again, but the family situation was delicate at best, and I didn't want to be in trouble if my little brother actually needed something. I made yeah. the decision to get up and go find out for myself. I bounded up the basement staircase, the only way a high schooler can, and I called out again for my brother. Reese, what's up? I'm really busy. I checked all around the main floor looking for my little brother or even signs he was home. No shoes, no backpack, so he wasn't home, and there was no car in the driveway either. The only reason my dad would be gone right now would be to pick him up. Satisfied, I turned back for the stairs, when I heard my little brother's voice ring out, Quinny, Quinny, come up. This time every hair on my body stood on end. It just didn't make sense. He had to be at practice, and if he really needed me, he would have come to me. Yeah. I go to the base of the second floor stairs and called out to him one more time. Reese, what's going on? Are you okay? For a minute, no answer. Reese, I'm really busy. Can you tell me what's up? It's quiet for way too long as I stared up the dark staircase. Logically, I had no reason to believe anyone was up there until I heard Reese's voice calmly speak this time and not call out in his sing-song way those same four words. Quinny, Quinny, come up. What? I asked under my breath. I couldn't comprehend the situation. I did quick inventory of any probable scenario. Break in? Wrong voice. A prank? I would have seen something at this point. It had to be Reese, and maybe helping him would make me a good brother. So I began up the stairs. My heart pounded with each step, and I was about to make the landing to the dark second floor. Then I heard the buzz of the garage door motor. I ran back down the stairs and looked out the window. It was my father's sedan and him and my little brother got out. I stumbled oh, from the window to the hall where they would enter, and I felt my heart almost stop beating. I collapsed on the floor and just started to cry uncontrollably. Whoa. Sorry for my life, but... This was like 15 years ago now when I was a kid. I was with my best friend Jackson at some abandoned family resort or bungalow colony type place in New York. 
It was off a main road and then down a private dirt path driveway entrance. And it was a rather large property with a bunch of old abandoned buildings including at least 10 small bungalows, a main hall, a few bathroom stations, and an indoor pool house. Along with that was an outdoor pool, a shuffleboarding area, and a kids playground. Everything was old, run down, and with tall overgrown grass growing over it. We found this place accidentally one time walking down Route 209, but we didn't explore it that day. We came back another night. By the time we went, it was past sunset. The sun was kissing the sky goodnight. It was getting very dark, but we didn't want to come during the day in fear of getting caught and getting charged with trespassing. We brought along walkie-talkies and flashlights with us to communicate to each other when we'd split up. We started looking around the bungalows together. Most of them looked the same and were relatively small. One or two beds each, a small kitchen, and one bathroom each. Some of them had these little living room areas. Halfway looking through these bungalows, I split off from Jackson because he was moving kind of slow. I tried to enter the building that looked to be the main hall or office or something, but every entrance was locked. I walkie-talkie Jackson to tell him that the big building was locked. He didn't walkie-talkie back. I wondered if I was out of range from where he was. Two minutes later, I found myself at one of the two bathroom buildings. It was probably a 400 square foot building. There were no doors to the building though. It was unusual. It just had two big openings, one for the men's room, one for the women's room. I remember the signs being faded and worn out looking. Then I saw these red tracks on the dirty old concrete bathroom floor. Now I'm not going to sit here and say they looked like bloody footprints, but I couldn't explain what these red marks could be then, and I still can't say for certain now. Regardless, it was pitch black inside that bathroom around that corner, and that was the first building I was scared to enter. I tried walkie-talking to Jackson again, hoping he was in range this time. I pressed the button on the walkie and said, yo, where are you? When I let go, I heard the beep sound that the receiving walkie makes after getting a message from inside the bathroom. Uh oh. It gave me a near heart attack. Then I thought Jackson must already be in there, hence the red looking footsteps. I called his name and it echoed into the bathroom. I was actually about to step into the bathroom thinking he was hiding from me, pranking me, when I heard Jackson's voice call out from the distance behind me, outside in the darkness of the night. I heard him getting closer. Couldn't see him in the dark, but he obviously saw my light, so I yelled back, I found your walkie-talkie. I started stepping into the bathroom, but then he said back, don't go in there, I never went in there. Uh. This is when I turned around and hurried right out of there. I pressed and released the talk button really quick on my walkie, pausing the beep again from inside that pitch black women's room. Jackson and I looked at each other for half a second, then began dashing in the direction we came. We made it back to Route 209 and had to stop to catch our breaths. This is when Jackson told me that inside one of the bungalows he went into, he tried walkie-talking me, but I wasn't answering, meaning we must have been out of range. But then he heard a noise from the living area of the bungalow. As he turned around, his flashlight revealed an older woman almost running towards him. He dropped his walkie-talkie and flashlight and ran out from the bungalow. He ran in the dark and hid, refraining from making noise in fear of being followed. He hid for a questionable amount of time before looking around and seeing my flashlight across the field, over at the bathrooms. The most likely explanation to me was that some cracked out drug addict was hiding or living in that abandoned bungalow and for whatever reason lunged at Jackson and picked up his walkie talkie. What she was doing in that bathroom, who knows. Maybe drugs, maybe the bathroom in the bungalow didn't work. But what I don't know is why was there a trail of what looked like blood in there. Those are my theories, but I can't explain all of it away. And that's the scariest part. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Those are three scary stories, but... And why do these people always want to explore abandoned places at night, okay? Which is crazy. They're abandoned for a reason, okay? And it makes logical sense that a home, that the homeless would go there because it's abandoned, right? Okay? Nobody's living there, right? And if they can get in there, that's shelter for them, okay? That would make sense. I would imagine that if homeless people could get to that place, those places, those bungalows, they would stay there because it's, it has a roof over their head. And if they're into drugs, they can do their drugs in there. And, you know, 
without fear of, uh, of people, you know, going in and out. Because it's even if they have to break into the windows or something, get in there, you know, or break the door open, they can get it. And it's a, it's, it's shelter for them. So why are these people surprised? And and they go to these places at nighttime, which is ridiculous. Okay, so anything that happens to you at going into these abandoned places and buildings and stuff at night, it, it kind of you kind of deserve it because. What do you expect, okay? These places are abandoned, okay? And it's, it's still a shelter, it's a structure, okay? So obviously if there's homeless people in the general area and stuff, of course, okay? And you hear about people uh, uh, hoarding, wait, not, I forgot what they call it, where people, they uh, squatters, squatters, where they squat on in the houses because there's sometimes there's houses that people that are selling or that are abandoned and stuff and people, they squat in it because it's, it's a structure. It's a shelter. It's a place where they can actually sleep. You know, they can stay out of the rain, out of the weather. They can do their drugs if they do drugs. Okay, and this it's a it's a living structure. So of course, so of course they're gonna be there. So why these people don't expect people to be living in there? I don't know. Okay, and now the second story, that was freaky because you you being in the house by yourself, okay, and you're not expecting anybody else that, but you keep hearing your little brother's voice, okay, that. That could be freaky. Or we're in, like I said, you know, that could be freaky, you know, because obviously that has to be, if it's not your little brother, because obviously he's coming home with your father, that could be somebody else, or maybe that could be one of your friends pranking you. That could, that could, uh, I guess that could be the story. It could be one of your friends pranking you. I could see that you know, being, because why, who else would know your name? Okay, that that would be the, the, part, the part I would worry about, because who else would know your name? Okay, that that would be, you know, a story. Somebody could know that, you know, you get out of school, one of your friends, they say, oh, I know he gets out of school because I'm you know, sure you talk about your friends about your schedule. Say, oh, I get home and my little brother goes to swimming practice. He doesn't get home until, until you know, I usually go down to the basement and do my homework. So it could be one of your friends just pranking you. Okay, that's the only explanation I can think of that maybe it's one of your friends pranking you, not your little brother, obviously, because he's coming home with your father. So, so he's obviously at swim practice, so it's not him. So it could be one of your friends just, you know, trying to mess with you, mess with you, because people, you know, people have six sense, of, six sense of humor. So I can see that happening. And the first story, again, that parrot did uh, potentially could save saved your life by making those noises. Obviously, that parrot saw that person, that stranger in there, and he obviously started, you know, started talking and getting excited because he sees, you know, a person in there that, you know, he's obviously been trained to, to talk to people, and he sees another person. So that's why obviously he kept you know, that Perry got excited and, and started moving around and, and talking and stuff because he, you know, he sees another person. And thankfully, you went back there. You heard it. You was not a light sleeper. You went down there and you, and like I said, you're pretty bold. You opened up that door and, <laughs> yeah, and, pan and then grabbed the guy out and wrestled with him. Okay. Because some people might have just say, screw this. I'm leaving. Leave the house. Grab the phone and leave the house and just call the cops from there. But you were pretty bold. He, open up the door because you don't know the guy could have had a weapon or whatever you never know it's obviously it's a homeless person but you never know they could have a knife or something on you know that they carry for protection and they couldn't wind up stabbing you or something so you're pretty bold but again that parrot did kind of alert you that was like an early early warning system actually in a way <laughs> that parrot okay so it was and i can see what you say with that being you kind of like your father's way of looking after you by keeping that parrot because you're the only one that decided to keep that parrot and Again, you got to be, again, you got to be careful. Okay, Zach, a homeless person breaks into your house. Again, like I said, it could be somebody that, you know, one of these homeless people, they, you know, they watch it. So although you, you wonder how people can wander the neighborhood, but maybe, you know, it's homeless and maybe they're mentally, you know, they're walking around, you know, you know, checking the doors and stuff. And, and they found one of the doors open and found a way to break into your house. And, but the, the parrot did kind of save your life in a way, save your or at least alert you to that something was happening. And and, th and like I said, you're a pretty bold person by, you know, reaching, the, you know, you said that fight or flight thing. You said, yeah, I'm a flight. And then you wrestled the guy down. <laughs> and thankfully you were strong enough to pin him down. Okay. And, and get him arrested and stuff. So again, that parrot did save your life. So it's a good thing you did take the parrot. Okay. Cause that would have, it could have ended, you know, could have ended a bad wish. What if you would have fell asleep and never heard the guy, you know, in your house you know, again, freaky, but again, that parrot did save your life. But anyway, those are three series, three good stories. So I like those stories. And, but like I said, the, the last story, again, I don't know why people decide to 
I know people, especially when you're young, you get, when you're young, you get reckless and you want to, but I'm not exploring stuff at nighttime. That's just nuts. Okay. I'm not going to an abandoned structure at night, but I don't, these people in these stories, they like to do that. I guess it wouldn't be a story if they didn't do that. Okay. Uh, but again, like I said, you should, you should expect uh, maybe homeless people to be in these places, or squatters to be in these places, because it's a structure, like I said, and it's, it's shelter from the from the outside world and stuff, and you can do your drugs in there. You don't have to worry about nobody, you know, coming in and out of there. So obviously, you would be, you know, homeless people in there. That would make logical sense. Why you want to explore that? I don't I have no idea. Anyway, let me know what you think of these Mister Nightmare stories. I'll leave a link to Mister Nightmare uh, channel in the description box so you can check them out for yourself. Also, have links to my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram. Also, have a link to my other channel, Bob Using the Pains. If you check that out as well. Also, I have a link down below to my Patreon. Again, my Patreon's only $5 a month. I have tons of content on there. I have over 180 videos on there, and I have them broken down into collections. Okay, there's five different collections. There's a movie collection. There's a uh, The Boys and Gen V collection. There's a Marvel TV show collection, a DC TV show collection, and a Star Wars TV show collection. Okay, you follow the link down below to check it out. And also, you get five-minute previews of all the videos that I have uh on my patron page so you can check it out you know you get a five nice five minute preview if you want to join support me that way also i have a link down below to my uh, merchandise store i recently opened up a merchandise store a couple of weeks ago and i have t-shirts uh sweatshirts hats cups mugs water bottles tons of stuff follow the link down below i'm even wearing one of the my shirts with the with my logo youtube username trey so there it is okay that's one of my shirts that i really like a baseball shirt Okay, it was designed by a YouTuber named Jay. He sent me the design, and I really liked it. So thank you, Jay, for that. And I put it on a bunch of merch in my store. So if you follow the link, you can check out all the stuff that I have. If you want to support me that way, I would greatly appreciate it. Also, please give this video a thumbs up. It helps the channel, and I truly appreciate it. Also, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, so you know when I upload new content to this channel. And this is Trey Pass. So sing so long, and take care.